19th century, sexism helped syphilis to spread. In the late 18th century, one in five Londoners contracted syphilis by their mid-30s. Syphilis would initially cause mild discomfort, such as a rash or pain in urination. Many people hoped it was just the clap, and would have began by self-medicating for many weeks with various pills and potions. There was certainly a large market for these. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. However, most people would find that this failed to alleviate symptoms. Instead, the disease would progress to a secondary stage of syphilitic infection. This would produce debilitating pain and fevers lasting weeks and even months, which could not be ignored. Women during the 19th century were expected to ignore all knowledge of the disease. This taboo only encouraged the spread of the disease from men to their wives across all classes. Upon realisation that the disease had not vanished, the men would face a moral dilemma and decide whether they should cancel their weddings, which would lead to social ruin, or marry their wives and infect them and their future children. The choice was an impossible task. Historically, syphilis was tremendously problematic to cure. Patients would often respond well to treatment, believing they were now cured, only for their symptoms to return months or even years later. These men would be given the all clear to marry, but would then infect their new wives when the treatment failed long term. The taboo of the disease would cause mental instability in its victims, with many becoming paranoid of being found out, and going to great lengths to hide it from those closest to them. The treatments would be drawn out, and the eventual outcome was uncertain, which led to patients becoming mentally unwell. 19th century doctors took seriously the notion that a diagnosis of syphilis could trigger acute despair. The impact of syphilis on the body was extreme. It could cause infertility, lead to miscarriages and stillbirths. The children that did survive may never show symptoms or they may die from serious health complications. This is the reason why syphilis is screened during the early stages of pregnancy in Britain, so that most cases are caught in pregnant women. However, infection was common during the 19th century with parents and children impacted. Scandal would often break out amongst families such as that of Gertrude Blood and Lord Colin Campbell. Lord Colin was treated for syphilis and believed he was cured, but he was not. When they married, he passed this on to Gertrude, who later decided she wanted a divorce on the grounds of cruelty. However, a woman needed to prove adultery, cruelty, desertion or bestiality. Women who found themselves infected by their husbands would be given little help or support from those in the medical and legal establishments. They would side with the men and attempt to protect the men only. Women patients often would not know that they had been infected because their doctors would withhold the information from them. She would only know that she was ill. She would not know why. Doctors used confidentiality as a way to excuse their behaviour. If they disclosed the woman's disease, it would highlight that the husband also had it. The couple would be treated by the doctor, but once the obvious symptoms disappeared, the husband would decide to terminate their treatment to avoid the wife becoming suspicious. A man's desires were prioritised over the women's. It was thought that the women may become hysterical if they knew and make the husband's life difficult. The men would be the one paying the doctor's bill, so his interest took priority. Ignorance was equated with innocence and purity, and the cost all too often was the woman's health. As the number of women doctors increased, the diagnoses were a lot more transparent and they would discuss a patient's medical health with them. We would condemn this behaviour in doctors nowadays, but back during the Victorian era, 
doctors were in a legal and professional bind. If they had disclosed this information to its female patients, they may have faced dismissal, and worst case scenario, they could have been sued for confidentiality breaches. British medical professions believed that prostitutes were the primary carriers of infection, and by the 1890s, people believed that it was spread by affluent men who exploited working-class women and affected their own families. The threat posed to women like Harriet and Gertrude became the focus of a campaign spearheaded by the New Woman Movement. Young, affluent and unchaperoned, the New Women rallied against sexual hypocrisy and demanded that women have knowledge of and control over their own bodies. Syphilis was the first new disease that was found after the invention of printing. It didn't take long for the newspapers to roll out various scaremongering papers and the news of this new disease spread quickly and caused panic among the public. Syphilis was often front page news and those that could read were well aware of the dangers of the disease. It was the first disease to be known as a sexually transmitted one which led to a huge amount of taboo, as it was often linked to a person's moral sexual state. The origin of the disease was debated over, with the European countries often blaming each other for the spread. There were many treatments used to try to treat the disease, and some of them were catastrophically dangerous, and some of the treatment caused worse symptoms than the disease itself. Unbeknown to the public, these treatments were very ineffective at treating syphilis. When syphilis was first being detected, many treatments were invented across Europe. Many were based on the idea of expelling the disease from the body, so methods such as bloodletting, which involved cutting the skin and letting the blood pour out, in the hope it would let out the diseased blood, before being replaced with blood that would not be diseased. Laxatives were also used to expel the disease through waste. Alongside this, taking baths in wine and herbs or olive oil was also used. These were some of the more mild treatments compared to the treatment that would be most common during this period. The most dangerous and mutilating treatment that was used was mercury. It was the longest serving treatment used for syphilis during this period. It was thought that syphilis was similar to leprosy and mercury had been used against this disease for many years. People were queuing up for a cure to this disease that represented a poor moral compass. Syphilitic patients were given this treatment in several ways. Some would rub it into their skin while others took it orally. Another method was used was called fumigation the mercury would be vaporised over a fire and the patients were then exposed to the steam that was emitted. Patients would sit on a bottomless seat over the hot coals or they would be placed in a box called a tabernacle where the whole body would be exposed except for the head. The idea behind using mercury was to encourage the patient to salivate the disease out of their body. Unfortunately, the use of mercury caused devastating symptoms, such as gum ulcers and loose teeth. Despite this, the use of mercury did not slow down. It was even discussed that an injection, including mercury, would be administered for patients. Without advanced medical knowledge, the syphilis would continue to spread throughout the body and it would cause long-term irreversible issues such as defects to the face and nose, where the nose would collapse. Syphilis had been turned into the biggest taboo of the times due to its sexual nature and those that were showing symptoms, especially physical mutilations, would be marked as a social pariah and a symbol of sexual deviancy. People tried to hide their illness and this was how artificial noses were introduced during the 16th century. A facial surgeon attempted to reconstruct nose defects. Tissue would be taken from the arm and sewn to the face 
and this would mean that patients would have to have their arm strapped to their face until the blood vessels grew in the correct place. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them.